Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and fantasy world history videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking on the join button down below or backing me on Patreon where you can get full access to all of the scripts I write for these videos and of course both memberships get advanced access to the uh, videos before I've released them to everyone else. And of course subscribe to me here on YouTube click that button as I upload at least twice a week. Viewer advisory. Today's video features topics of vile evil. Don't put this on the speaker in the workplace or around your kids. I can't do this monster justice if I have to stay completely family friendly, so I'm not even going to try. Pick an evil power in the multiverse. Trace it back far enough and the creature I'm about to describe to you will likely have some hand in its origin. I've had a few requests to talk about Eggwilf, I've had a few requests to talk about the Book of Vile Darkness, and I'll get to those. But in order to understand some aspects of evil itself, it's necessary to talk about the Berneloth, the first evil, the defilers, the root of all woe, they whom the fiends call the oldest. Berneloths are the oldest species in the lower plains. They are, however, well known to lie about everything all the time so even the oldest of their own records of their history is twisted with so much fiction it's impossible to say with any certainty where they came from or how long they've been there if you were to believe their accounts they are the original powers of the lower planes they lured the obreth to the prime material plane orchestrated the creation of the first tanari demons manipulated the forces of law and chaos into conflict with each other twisted and tempted some of the angels into becoming the first devils and have spawned the one truly native race of the lower planes who have always been the neutral party of pure evil profiting from the eternal war between law and chaos the yugoloths However, ask a Yugoloth plying its trade on the rough, slick cobbles, the fog-choked and crowded streets of Sigil, and it will tell you that the reputation Yugoloths have is largely unfounded bigotry. They play a vital role in the Blood War, and as an impartial network of highly skilled immortals who perform services for money, just like any other faction in the multiverse. They are no more capable of manipulation of grand cosmic events than they are of secretly orchestrating everything to some long-range end goal. It's ridiculous. Why, surely, given their wealth and influence, they would have taken control by now if they had any intention or ability to do so. The Planescape box set of source books titled Planes of Conflict, written by Michelle Carter, Dale Donovan, and Andrea Hayday, published December 1995, is easily the most detailed body of law on the Yugoloths, and I'll be quoting directly from it a bit in this video. Um, I'm barely touching on it though, the amount of information in there is huge. The Planescape books have a unique style to them which is more like the current source books such as Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, with text written as transcribed spoken accounts by characters from the setting, interviews and such, along with the blocks of general law and game mechanics. I think first it's vital to convey that Yugoloths are evil. To state clearly what that means and how it fundamentally defines them, they do not feel pleasure, they don't feel sadness, hate, anger or any of the other emotions you are convinced all intelligent creatures must experience. They are born of a plane of existence that is grey, bleak, old, rotted away, bleached of hope, promise or reward. There is simply no chance that they could ever feel those emotions. The very environment they are native to is in direct opposition to any sort of positive feeling and their existence has never benefited from any sort of emotions so they just don't have the capacity for them if you throw the ball of emotion at them they have no arms to catch it the very first of them the banaloths rose out of the ash mire and muck a hideous form of life with a cold and deadly form of intelligence devoid of empathy pity or mercy they are pure neutral evil in some ways, it's best to think of them as robots who took one look at the first other forms of life in the multiverse and came to the instant assessment that it was not only weak, stupid and pointless, but that so were they, and they were also wretched, disgusting and even more pointless. The only reason for their existence was as pawns and playthings of higher powers, and no matter what they did, they would never be the equal of them. So, from the very first, they never thought to even try no, there was only one logical thing they could do, and that was to find a way to take control of it all, and use the most powerful resource they had to do so, their intelligence, and their ability to do whatever it took, unburdened by morals, ethics, doubt, worry, or guilt. 
Their weapons of choice are manipulation and cruelty. While one can reason that a shark is not evil and that it may be eating you alive, but it's not doing so out of malice, just simple unthinking hunger, the Yugoloth knows exactly what it's doing. It has spent centuries studying the pain and suffering of other creatures. It's fascinated by torment, pain and suffering, much like one would go down to the gun range and fire bullets at targets, adjusting the scopes, practicing and keeping one's skills sharp. Yugoloths constantly manipulate, twist, bully, persuade, torment, and brutally murder other beings just to keep their skills sharp. What other thinking beings find so hard to understand is that the Yugoloths don't actually derive any pleasure out of this at all. Everything they do, every action they take, is calculated to evoke the emotions and goad the specific actions of others. When they bite into a delicate morsel of the most exotic and expensive food, or sip from the precious vessels that most rare and incredible beverages of the multiverse, and make a show of savouring it and describing its wonders, it's all an act. To them, a hunk of rotting meat crawling with maggots is just the same as perfectly cooked Wagyu ribeye steak. It differs in texture and flavour, but they don't care either way. Neither is more or less satisfactory to a creature incapable of feeling satisfaction. They know exactly how to act satisfied, and for each of them, they have gotten so skilled at it, they maintain the act at all times. So for them, their natural behavior is to pretend to have emotions without actually having the feelings attached to the actions. This means that Yugoloth can express any emotion, no matter what is happening, what it's thinking. It expresses any emotion that will achieve the response it wants from those around it. And what it is always doing is seeking to control them. How cruel can a Yugoloth be? As cruel as they think they can get away with. How can you tell you are being manipulated by a Yugoloth? because the Yugoloth is aware of you. Is the Yugoloth going to leave me alone if I don't have something it wants? It doesn't want anything. That implies an emotion or desire. Any creature is useful to test methods of torture and manipulation, and that in itself is of use to the Yugoloth. If they te can tear your life apart with minimal risk to themselves, that's exactly what they will do when they have the spare time for it. Those of you who ask, what if a Yugoloth is raised from birth in a loving environment, or is transformed by a magical effect that reverses its alignment? In order to go from right to left-handed, you first need to have hands. Yugoloths are not evil because they choose to be evil, they are evil because they have an utter absence of emotions, empathy, and morals that leads directly to their actions being evil. They can't be made be to be good, the very stuff that they're made from negates goodness, nullifies emotions, destroys feelings. There is nothing there to transform or influence. Go ahead and hug your toaster as much as you like. It's not going to stop burning your bread. Casting spells to try and change its mind are not going to make it suddenly able to freeze bread instead. So now that's out of the way. Let me just say that it is great to convey this nature of Yugoloths in a stark and horrific way to players during the game. Let's say they've been visiting an Arcana demon, or an Arcanoloth, in El Tabar, the second largest city in Thay. This canine-headed being typically operates during business hours, polymorphed into the form of a cultured gentleman in very expensive clothing, and they've been having him identify magical items for them for free, as long as he gets first option to buy treasures they're seeking to sell. This has been going on for some time, and now they have offended the Guild of Merchants, including the powerful Red Wizards who seek to control all magic item sales in the city. So now the only place they can get anything like a reasonable deal is Gathera, the Arcanaloth, who has, for the last few visits, let slip some of his otherworldly features. But today, when the player characters visit his office and shop of exotic wonders, an artifact of some power in their possession, he's not in the front office where he always meets them. He calls to them from a back room, down a corridor, a dark corridor with a few side rooms. The party makes their way through the building. One of the doors is open just a crack, and there's a smell coming from the room beyond. It is very much like the taint of blood coming from a butcher's shop. As the curious player character opens the door to peek inside, the door from the shop into the corridor slams shut and locks tight. Githera, appears at the end of the hall in his natural form, and the players are looking into a room full of mutilated people and animals. Githera has multiple means of escaping, of course, but it's just become time to put the greed of the characters and of the players at the table to the ultimate test. He's been monitoring them, and he knows full well they have a very valuable prize in their possession. Banalos are the original species 
who all of the Eugoloths and the Gerolaths are derived. They are the architects of the hag species, who have something of a symbiotic relationship with Vanaloths. Quite a complicated one. Vanaloths in their natural form, unaltered, look like 8 foot or 2.4 meter tall spindly gaunt and gangly horrors with long and lanky humanoid arranged bodies withered scarred and warped by disease their limbs are also grossly misshapen and disproportionate to all but its overly large head which looks like a horse skull with its twisted ram's horns almost skeletal but like the rest of its frame with gray and pustulant skin pulled tight over the underlying bone the pockmarked skin is stretched far too tight to its discolored skeleton, oozing pus. Its long jaw is filled with nothing but teeth and a revolting pointed tongue. Rivulets of noxious fluid constantly leak from its rotting yellow eyes, conveying nothing but a sense of ultimate malice. Though these creatures are technically Eugloths, they don't have much in common with their lesser children. The Banaloths stand outside of the hierarchy of the common Eugloth, and no Eugloth would try to harm a Banaloth or disobey one of its wishes, because they know full well to do so would be as good as a horrible suicide. The powers and abilities of these creatures far exceed their wretched appearance. They are in many ways close to the threat of an evil demigod, though it would be incredibly rare to actually have one of them come out of its web of concealment and manipulation to face an opponent openly, in person. When they do so, it is once again a calculated action designed to manipulate. Banaloths are fascinated with cruelty. They are the very essence of callous detachment, never reacting to the suffering and pain that they ceaselessly create, an unending process of misery and affliction, a monster that mechanically, methodically hurts harms, foils, impairs, and hinders all other creatures, as if that is the only reason it can see for them being there. They exist to suffer, it exists to inflict that suffering. There is no other complexity to it. Over the eons of their existence, even the uh, lesser Eugoloths have put a little consideration into the deeper meaning of their existence. They may, may even have personal goals that are quite close to an actual desire. They may cultivate such elaborate webs of deception that the stark primal horror of the Banaloth can cause them a lot of disruption in their efforts to sweep such evil back under the carpet of the grand con game. So the Banaloths are the outcasts among the ranks of the Eugoloths. They rarely associate with other Eugoloths and are always found in the Grey Waste, never on Gehenna where so many of the others have migrated. Banaloths have no respect for the efforts of the lesser Eugoloths and seem to relish foiling their well-laid plans, spreading vicious lies and revealing sinister secrets in order to cause more dismay. All the while, these creatures of pure evil stare at their victims with a chillingly disturbed detachment. Banaloths take no pleasure in their work, yet certainly show no regret. The lesser Eugoloths may act to defend themselves, but they will not raise a hand to the Banaloth, and certainly do nothing to spare any other creature from their master's torments, though they might stick around to watch what happens. There are a few reasons, aside from being the first of their kind, and thus the most senior evil in the lower planes, that the Banaloth are considered greater Eugoloth and afforded such massive respect. Even though they are not physically as powerful as some Eugoloths that are certainly much more powerful than the Ultraloths found in the core Monster Manual for 5th edition. Also, while I can give you the base stats for the Baneloth, it's not actually what physical player characters will face in the game itself, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. In combat, Baneloths wear no armor, no clothing, carry no magical items, no weapons. They make use of their inherent magical powers and physical attacks with their claws and formidable bite. Believe me, that's sufficient. The Banaloth is at least a challenge rating 20 legendary creature with a natural armor class of 19 and at least 400 hit points. They move at a speed of 40 feet per round and have a strength of 20, dexterity of 12, constitution of 20, intelligence of 22, wisdom of 16, and charisma of 20. They have a 120 foot true, true sight and a passive perception of 18. They have a legendary resistance three times per day that allows them to shrug off anything that would require a saving throw. They are totally immune to disease, poison, and acid, and take half damage from cold, fire, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. I'd also probably argue that they've got resistance at least to necrotic attacks. They have advantage on all saving throws against spells and other magical effects and cannot be charmed, frightened, or have their movement impaired by any difficult terrain on the plane of Hades. The Banaloth's physical strikes all count as magical. They have a reach of 10 feet. They are plus 10 to hit, 
with two claw and one bite attacks on its turn, plus legendary actions allow it to cast spells or inflict more claw attacks on other creatures during the rest of the round. A claw attack inflicts 3d8 plus 5 slashing damage, the bite causes 3d10 plus 5 piercing damage, and all carry the wounding property, so that any time that a claw or bite attack hits, the victim must make a DC 19 constitution saving throw or take an additional 4d10 necrotic damage. Also, up to three times in the next 24 hours, the Baneloth can simply inflict the same wounds on any creature it has previously struck with its claws, bite, or both. It need only be within sight of the creature and whatever the maximum damage was that the Baneloth infl managed to inflict on that victim over one round of combat previously, it repeats. No attack roll, no saving throw, the wounds will simply tear open of their own accord. The Baneloth has three legendary actions it can take outside of its own turn. Only one legendary action option can be used at a time and only at the end of another creature's turn, with all of the legendary actions refreshing at the start of the next round. The Bandloth can spend one action to make a claw or bite attack, one action to use one of its spell-like abilities, or two actions to use a unique, specific ability that the Bandloth has, and I'll just discuss more on that in a little, a little bit. The Bandloth's in a uh, innate spellcasting ability is Charisma. The spell save DC uh, is 18. The Ultraloth um, is also got a lot of these sort of spells. There's, there's some crossover and similarity between the two. You can see that they're closely related. But the Baneloth's powers are greatly extended. They can innately cast the following spells requiring no material components. At will, they can Alter Self, cast Clairvoyance, Command, Darkness, Detect Magic, Detect Thoughts, Dispel Magic, Phantasmal Force, Invisibility, Revivify, and Vampiric Touch. Three times a day, they can cast Contagion, Dimension Door, Fear, Finger of Death, Polymorph, Power Word Pain, and Teleport. Once a day, they can cast Firestorm, Mass Suggestion, and Power Word Heal. Now you may wonder, why can they revivify and cast Heal to completely heal something? Well, so they can bring it back from the death and torture it to death a little bit more. Now, that covers the basic features common to most Baneloths, but over the eons that they have existed, each individual has become a unique creature that, with quirks, traits, and powers of its own. Often, Baneloths will make bargains with night hags to undergo magnificent dark transformation rituals that can grant the Baneloth tremendous increases in power. Others, through the course of thousands of years of their wretched existence, master strange powers granted from demiplanes, lost magic, even abilities stolen from dead gods. Who knows? Here are just a few of the examples of these powers, and you can apply any of them that you like, make up your own, combine them to create specific themes, I leave it up to you. First one uh, is example is withering. Physical strikes may inflict an agonizing withering of the flesh, as well as the wounding saving throw. The victim must make a save versus withering, or have one level of exhaustion inflicted on them and be incapacitated for the following round as they are racked with incredible amounts of pain. Normal rest will not remove the sort of exhaustion so that they suffer the effects of it until such time as they can be magically restored. This counts as a curse. This can only inflict, uh, be inflicted up to three times on any one target and only once per round. The effect is horrific to witness and should require those adjacent to the victim or the Baneloth to make a DC 15 wisdom saving throw versus fear. Uh, it would be a DC 19 saving throw to save versus withering. Profane Regeneration. The Baneloth regains 10 hit points at the start of its turn. If the Baneloth takes Radiant or Holy damage, this trait doesn't function at the start of the Baneloth's next turn. The Baneloth only dies if it starts its turn with 0 hit points and doesn't regenerate. Also, unless removed from the Plane of Hades and buried in Consecrated Ground, the Baneloth will spontaneously rise from the dead within 66 plus 6 days. Life Drain. The Baneloth targets one creature it can see within 120 feet of it. The target must succeed on a DC 19 constitution saving throw, taking 8d8 necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. The Baneloth regains a number of hit points equal to half the amount of damage dealt this way. Summon Child. The Baneloth can summon any fiend, daemon, demon, devil, yugoloth, in existence once per day. 
though it is loath to do so because it is disgusted by the weaker fiends it can control. The Bandloth can summon even an abyssal lord or lords of the Nine Hells, but these are not under the control of the Bandloth and the ensuing rampage will probably kill everyone. Root of all evil. No Bandloth is like any other and nearly all of them share one or more features with their offspring. After only a week of vile meditation and self-experimentation, a Bandloth may grant itself one special ability or attack or quality of another kind of fiend, demon and so on. This manifests physically on the body of the Bandloth and may not be reversed. It can only have a few of these traits that it has applied over the millennia. Ancestors bidding. The Bandloth has the power to demand obeisance of all of its children in a shockwave of sickly grey energy. A Bandloth can attempt to dominate all evil creatures within 300 feet of itself as a standard action. All evil creatures must make a DC 19 wisdom saving throw or be affected by a dominate spell. They are, there are plenty of exceptions to this, particularly creatures which are of sufficiently higher rank, so over DC 12 and creatures already dominated or devoted completely to some other master, but it is highly effective on hordes of demons and the rank and file of the armies of the Nine Hells, who can suddenly turn around and all be working for the Baneloth. Shield of the Innocent. This horrific power is the bane of Crusaders of Light. When targeted by any divine attack of a holy, blessed, or good nature, the Bandloth can instantly summon one of the innocent souls of all of the victims it's murdered and trapped in a vile prison outlawed by all of the gods. This shimmering spectre suffers the full brunt of the attack and is uh, and it is exactly like the attack struck an innocent being, inflicting terrible agony to them as they are released, still bound to the Bandloth's wicked sorcery. Bandloth takes no damage of the or ill effect from this attack and observes the torment that this causes in the attacker with some interest. As I Die is perhaps the most fearsome of all the powers of the Bandaloth. When this Bandaloth is slain by another living being, its dark essence clings to the soul of the person who slew it. The soul is now bound in such a way that only true resurrection can restore the soul to its original state. While bound, the essence of the Bandaloth slowly transforms the body of the victim over several days, during which time they will suffer unimaginable agony. No magical intervention short of a wish can slow this process and nothing can stop it. Eventually the victim will be transformed into the original form of the dead Baneloth, now restored to life and in full control, drawing sustenance from the tortured soul still trapped within it. The only way to save the victim is to kill the Baneloth once more and cast true resurrection on the corpse, but now a new victim is about to suffer a horrible fate and on. And on it goes. Weavers of flesh. The Baneloth may very well have crafted the very first generations of every fiendish creature in existence. Perhaps the truth is lost and realities altered and long lost by the actions of gods and powers messing with space and time. The Baneloth know the secrets of twisted uh, dark arts and the secrets of mutating a creature into a new form of life. There is no limit to this power and specific Baneloth are known for their mastery of forming anomalies which had never before come into existence. For example, one created a half golem Baylor ghost. Another is rumoured to have given life to the illithid race. Is this true? Who can possibly say for sure? Many Baneloths are no longer recognisable as what they once were, such as Apomps, the three-sided one, deity and creator of the Demodans of Gehenna, or Harashek Ap Thilkesh, the blind clockmaker, rule of the demiplane called the Clockwork Gap, and so on. There's no reliable record of them all. It's impossible to track them all down, and most have retreated far into Hades, living in dread and twisted towers so desolate that even denizens of Hades find them menacing. The Bandaloth's motivations are inscrutable. Their past is shrouded in lies. Their goals seem to differ from the typical Yugoloth's obsession with gaining vast amounts of wealth and influence by creating and then selling their services to both sides of any conflict. What is absolutely true, though, is that the Bandaloths are likely the most evil beings in the entire multiverse. If you like the lore in these videos, don't forget to check out the uh, fellow videos by fellow Forgotten Realms lore masters and also some uh, surprisingly good crafting channels. Check out my channels tab where I have a list of all of them for you to explore. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise from my Teespring store where you'll geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.